Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, y'all. I'm Katie. I'm an alcoholic. I'm from the great state of Texas. Yeah. That is not the South, so don't get don't get confused. It is, uh, you know, you got you got the South is south of Texas, and the West is southwest of Texas or west of Texas. Texas is Texas. Okay, so let's just get that real clear. It stands on its own. Uh, it's very good to be here. I want to thank the committee for having me. It's uh, 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 Kathy was great. Susan was wonderful. Kathy was great. I mean, she's she's a texting fool, boy, emailing and texting, and you want salmon or pork or, you know. I'm like, God dang, this is great, boy. I mean, you were on it, and I really do appreciate it. It takes a lot of people to put one of these together, and it uh, it doesn't go unnoticed. We get the the privilege of going to quite a few of these, and, and you know, it's um, it's always a lot of work. So let's give them all a big hand. I've had the gift of sobriety since October the 28th of 1984, and um, if any of you guys had the privilege of hearing my husband earlier today, you you know that that is uh, five and a half months more than he has. (laughs) That is important. People say time doesn't matter. Oh, it does. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. At our house, when it starts to get tough and Charlie has a hard time, I say, honey, it'll make a lot more sense in about five and a half months. Just, (laughs) Just hang in there with me. Oh, we play like that. You know, any any of you guys, how many of y'all are, are uh, married to an alcoholic? Two alcoholics married together. That is, that's spicy. spicy. I like to call it passionate. Yeah. Two self-centered, hard-headed individuals go at it. Boy, there is no, no surrender on either side, you know. Um, my home group is the primary purpose group in Austin, Texas. We meet on Tuesday night at 730 and uh, we study the big book line by line. It's really a pretty spectacular meeting. We've been meeting for about six and a half years, and we have over 200 people studying the big book. And isn't that spectacular? And, you know, there was a time, I've been sober 27 years, there was a time in my sobriety where a big book study meeting would not have even appealed to me. And so you'll hear that, especially you said you had 26 years in relapse. Yeah, that, that, well, you know, by golly, we need to wake up to that. That that's happening. That happens more than not. And a lot of my story is about that. I don't spend much time in my drinking. I spend much more time in my 27 years of sobriety. And, um, but, you know, i got to tell you guys, it is the primary purpose group. When we started studying that big book, I never thought I would be that interested in it. And it took such a level of desperation to get me to pick that book back up. And what I didn't realize is every answer to every problem I have is in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. You could have told me that when I had... 8, 10, 12, 15 years sober, and I'd say you're crazy. But today I understand that to be very true. Um, I want to tell Ron what a spectacular job he did last night. Did you guys get a chance? I know. He is. Ron is, Ron is my brother. I really believe, personally, I could have fit in that family quite well. I think I could have been the little sister. And, uh, I, and since uh, everybody went Willie, is named with an R, so I thought I could be Ruby. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be Ruby. And, uh, but I, I tell you, could you imagine growing up in that family with six boys? Just think about that mother. Let's have a moment of silence for her. <laughs> my God almighty. Oh my God. And you know, I love, I love when you were talking about Perry Mason, you know, you got, you got to be born in the forties or fifties to appreciate those, those programs. You know, the kids nowadays, they, they have cable, they got nothing. You know, they got nothing. We had three channels. News came on at six. Cartoons were on on Saturday. Rest of the time you're out riding your bicycle. Or for us, running behind the mosquito machine in Houston. You know what I mean? Now they're all worried about, you know, spraying for mosquitoes. We ran behind the darn mosquito man. You know, he'd come, it's like, what? Your parents would go, go run behind that, suck in all that DDT or whatever it is. <laughs> oh. But, you know, you were talking about Perry Mason, and I loved it because I believe Dell really wanted, uh, what was his name, Peter Drake. See, she wanted him. She didn't want Perry. 
Yeah, she wanted him. <laughs> then we could go to Dr. Kildare if we really want to go way back. <laughs> Heck, my mother wanted Dr. Kildare. Oh. oh, yeah. Let's just have a moment on that one, too. Yeah. Okay, we're back again. <laughs> um, you know, I, 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 we, I've had, uh, Charlie and I, like I said, we, get, we have the privilege of going around a lot of places. And, and, you know, there's just nothing better than holding an AA convention in a casino. <laughs> I mean, God almighty, do you love it? Yeah. All it, it just needs to be tied to an outlet mall, and, man, we are living, you know. And, you know, it, 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 you, know you walk in here, and it's, it's, a, it's a little difficult to figure out. who. It's hard to tell who is one of us. And who needs to be one of us? I mean, have you picked him out? You looked at him and go, oh, dude, dude. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, okay, so I got sober at 26 years old. I'm 54 years old. I have two beautiful children, 33 and 23. I have three fabulous grandchildren. And uh, I swear, our grandkids are like God's do-over. Wouldn't you agree? To an alcoholic, he goes, here, here's some grandbabies. Try to do it right this time, could you do it? Yeah. I swear Max, is a, the oldest one, is almost six, and he'll say, Graham, can I have a popsicle before dinner? I'm like, have three. <laughs> I swear, run with scissors. I don't care. Watch as many cartoons as you want. It's all good. Uh, but, oh, my gosh, I'm just, I'm absolutely crazy about my grandbabies and, you know, being 54 years old, you know, I'm clearly on the back nine, right? You know, I mean, I, I, I believe we, we've established that I'm on the back nine. We just hope I'm not putting on the 18th hole today. You know what I mean? I mean, I'd like to, like to have a little bit of the back nine going. But, you know, the book says the most satisfying years of my existence lie ahead. And for me, that's very, very true. And I encourage you to, to lay your experience up against that and ask yourself today, because I believe there are people in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous who are not laughing. You know, when we're all laughing, not everybody in here is laughing. And there's a lot of people, I think, in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous that are dying. And they're dying with time. And I uh, I was one of them. And so that's what a lot of my story is about. It's a lot of what Charlie's story is about. We talk a lot about untreated alcoholism in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Mike Lorenz uh, refers to it as middle management. You know, uh, he says there's a lot of hope for the new guy. But if we don't have middle management, the new guy's got no hope at all. And so I'm going to talk a lot about that. Um, my my husband likes to refer to me a little as uh, taking a drink out of a fire hose. You might get a little more than you were bargaining for, you know. I can blow your lips right off your face, boy. And as we begin, you will see. You will also see that I am no wordsmith. So if I get something mixed up, just stick the right thing in there and you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying? Come. This is Alcoholics Anonymous, for God's sakes, right? But um, I do believe today that I am a vessel. I am the vessel that can get you connected to the power. I am not the power, but I can get you connected. The book says I must have a message of depth and weight. I believe I have a message of depth and weight. And I have been given the power to help another drunk. And I can tell you 100% that I do believe that. I, I can help when no one else can. Don't ever lose sight of that. It is not optional to not carry the message. It is not optional to not sponsor book says in the 12th step, having had a spiritual awakening, if you've had a spiritual awakening, it's time to carry that message. It's one of the greatest gifts you will ever do in AA is to watch another person light up, watch their, their world come together, help others. I love what Dr. Bob says about it. It's my duty. It's my duty. It's not about me staying sober. As a matter of fact, my life gets so much better when I sponsor. I want to kill them sometimes. Don't get me wrong. You know what I mean? Oh, my God. How many of you guys have just wanted to strangle a sponsee? I really like this whole sponsorship sponsee deal that was going on here. He didn't get up because he didn't have a tie on. Uh, Okay, so let me get started. Uh, And I want to thank the tapers. The tapers, I, I think the tapers are a very important part of these things, guys. 
Without them, we would not have the history that we're making today. And, and the beauty of this kind of stuff, they, one of the things that Charlie and I did is we, we learned so much on the CDs of big book studies. That's really what our passion is. I love the hour talk. Don't get me wrong. I love the roundups. But I love to teach the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and we get the privilege of being asked. So does, so does Ron and his brother Ralph. And, and, you know, you sit down and you start reading this. This book is a, it's spiritual literature, right? I believe that it was so divinely inspired by God. And if it is divinely inspired, it's designed to be studied, not read, but studied. And you have to have somebody to teach it to you. And that's one of the things that I love. We went to some fabulous teachers that taught it to us. We had the most amazing spiritual awakening at 17 years of sobriety. And, uh, you know, we've been doing this deal for 10 years at a level that I didn't even know was available. And one of the things that, that I didn't understand is I have a disease that started long before I took a drink. Long before I took a drink. When I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I knew that I was alcoholic because of a certain circumstance that happened in my life. And, and today I understand that it's the fact that I have an allergy with an obsession. And that that is what makes me alcoholic. It's driven by a malady. I get that now. Boy, the doctor's opinion. And, and uh, uh, there is a solution more about alcoholism. Explain it beautifully in the book. But I did not understand that. And, and honestly, nobody explained it to me. But I got to tell you, what they explained to me was enough to keep me sober. So it's not saying anybody did it wrong. But I tell you, when we find out the way that the book says it's clear-cut directions... Leaves no wiggle room. Everybody may have their own experience with the steps, but the directions are clear cut. And so I understand that I had a disease that started long before I took a drink. And I'll tell you guys, my uh, uh, I had a situation. I was born in 1958. I was the youngest of three kids. It was me, my sister, and my brother. We were all two years apart. My household was a whole lot like Mad Men. Do you guys watch that? I love Mad Men. And, I mean, we were a party in family. My dad was an ex-NFL football player, and let me tell you, they play. When they play, they play fun. And I loved it. There was nobody being knocked around. There was no bad thing with alcohol. It was just a blast. And I just loved everybody that came over, and it just seemed like they were all so jolly. And uh, then all of a sudden, out of the blue, my mother gets sick when I'm eight years old. She goes into the hospital, and she never returns. She dies. And uh, she died of a kidney disease. And my dad, at that point, was a travel and salesman for Union Carbide. And he left on Mondays and came home on Fridays. And he remarried three times in an 18-month period. That's a player. He's a player. <laughs> Didn't realize it at the time. I understand it today. But uh, so he remarried. The first wife stayed. She came in at six weeks and stayed for a weekend. <laughs> Lovely. And uh, but so he he remarried three times and we had four live in housekeepers. So in a 18 month period, we had seven women come through our door after having lost your mother. Now, I would have swore to God that's what made me alcoholic. As a matter of fact, if you would have had to endure that pain, you would have drank, too. I had no idea that it, I, I have a genetic bullet. I didn't get that. And I didn't get that for many years sitting in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I think I was just asleep a lot of the time. I did big book studies. We did Joe and Charlie were really big back in the 80s. I mean, we were doing it all. The only problem was is I thought that AA was for drinking. Codependency recovery, because it was the 80s, was about living. And church was about spirituality. Nobody told me that. I just assumed that. So when I, today I understand that all of these old ideas I have from growing up, and good God, do I have a lot of them, um, all that was was it just influenced my old ideas. And where do I find my old ideas? I find them in a third column of a four-column inventory. You know, when, the, when it says in, in, in how it works, it says that we had to let go of our old ideas. The result was nil until we let go absolutely. I couldn't even even told you what an old idea was. It's a belief system. Women are, men should be, you know, kids are, parents are. It's just what I had ingrained in me. And so that's what I didn't understand is that these old ideas, and then I get old ideas. Gosh, we got old ideas coming into AA, don't we? These old ideas that newcomers should. You shouldn't sleep with a newcomer. How about that one? Oh, yeah, until they're, until all of a sudden I'm single and they look pretty good. 
you know. If all of a sudden I'm married, by God, you shouldn't sleep with the newcomer. I'm no longer married. He is cute. <laughs> See, the old idea is they can switch and swap and, they, oh, they flip and flop. You know, the ego of the alcoholic is like a shapeshifter. Oh, it just changes. And then it's, it's like the drink. And I love the way Ron said it last night. I've got no experience. After I realized I was in trouble with drinking, it wasn't like I ever said I should never do this again. Instead, I'd say things like, I'm just not going to drink that booze again. I'm not going to hang with those people again. Well, that same ego is working on me when I'm sober. And it's just telling me all kinds of stuff. So it becomes a shapeshifter, and the longer we're sober, the more crafty it is. Because when we're in early sobriety, we can, we can get away with a lot, can't we? Heck, we could still lie and cheat and steal and be okay. Because spiritually, I hadn't grown that much. So spiritually, it doesn't disturb me. Now, I don't even like to bother you, even if you bug the crap out of me. Because it disturbs me. We were talking about that at lunch today. When my spirit gets disturbed, I used to be a scrapper, man. Oh, don't get me wrong. I still can be. <laughs> but uh, I walk away feeling terrible. And if I hurt you, I hurt even more. That's all new stuff, boy. That is a new spiritual growth for me. Well, so I, my mother dies, and it gets crazy in my household. I start drinking at about 11 or 12. I can't really pinpoint it. I remember where it was. I remember what the drink was. But I can't remember if I was 11 or 12. But I can tell you, it was tough to get booze when you were young. You, you, uh, true? I mean, it was like you could only drink so much of your parents' booze before you got in trouble. And so um, we used to go sit in front of the 7-Eleven. And I love this. You'd wait for the creepy guy to come, right? <laughs> oh, you girls. And the women always nod their head. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We've been using those powers for a long time. Yeah, there's... There's no Mother Teresa's in this room, boy. And, and uh, so we've been using these powers for a long, long time. You wait for the guy, and I'm going to assume he must have been probably 35 or 40. He looked really old. <laughs> but we were, we were 12, and we were on our bicycles. And he'd come driving up, and it'd be me and my other two girlfriends. We'd say, hey, can you get us some, uh, some Boone's Farm? And he'd go, I sure can. Oh, yeah. And then our biggest task was to lose creepy guy. Yeah. And that wasn't really too hard on a bicycle. He had a car, and we were just going to shoot right into the woods, you know, and we knew those woods like the back of our hands. Getting rid of creepy guy was a little bit like flicking a booger off your finger, but you, you could do it eventually. And, uh, you know, what, one of the things that I think is very interesting is, you know, uh, I, I know that creepy guy is in the room, aren't you? Oh, I know. I know he's here. Yeah. I can spot you at an AA meeting like that. Which brings me to, you know, everybody always says stick with your own experience. I got tons of experience, but I also, it may sound like an opinion, but it's experience. Um, you know, we women in AA, we, we come in and, and, you know, one of the things is, is you take away the drink. And until I've had a spiritual awakening, I'm going to use anything I can. And most of us use our sex powers. Women do, especially. And so you take away the drink. And unfortunately, in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I find it gets very distorted. Women come in and they say, I don't like women. And if they tell the boys that, the boys go, well, you know what? You know, until you can find some women you like, you just hang with us. <laughs> what is up with that? She is working you like a rented mule, ma'am. And, <clears throat> and so what ends up happening is is, uh, you know, what I say to do, and, and the prettier they are, the more danger they're in. And, and because they're in danger because the women in AA won't go to them because they're too pretty and they pose themselves as a threat. And the men go, hey, they, they're just, you know, we got to do something. And the truth of the matter is, is we're, yeah, we're working an angle, trust me. And so I'm a big fan of telling the women, scoop those women up and you boys walk those women over to the women that's what we need to be talking about a little bit more in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous you bet don't buy into that because remember I'm the little 12 year old who had the mark of the 40 year old man we, we know what we're doing don't, don't underestimate the power of a woman we know the power um, 
Well, so what ended up happening? We, I have a tremendous issue. I mean, I have a tremendous experience with outside issues, but I am very respectful of singleness of purpose. And uh, so there was a tremendous amount of that going on because it was very hard to get booze. But we did get plenty of booze. And um, I ended up finding that uh, I became quite the cheater in school. You know, I, I don't I'm not a big fan of the education system. I really for me, I don't really care much about education. Don't get me wrong. Please hear this all the way out before you judge what I'm saying. You can hear a ton of people that go back and get their education after they got sober. If you feel that alcoholism robbed you of your education, man, I'll be your biggest cheerleader. But I never really cared for formal education. School just never did it for me. I was all about social. I was voted most likable four years in a row. You know, I mean, I was all about being every queen you could be. I did the whole deal. It was all a social event. And I became quite a cheater. I mean, wow. I cheated on a level that I should have got a Ph.D. for the cheating I did from from the second grade on. I mean, I could I could break back into the school and all you needed was a number two pencil, man. There were no computers or anything. And and uh, and today, sometimes it catches up with me and, and it sneaks up on me. You know, a guy had come into our meeting and he was he was from Norway. And I have another sponsor. We call each other dumb and dumber. And. Um, he, he comes in, he says, um, you know, he's, he, he's, we know he's from Norway, and she says, is, is he uh, from Norwegia? And, and I looked at her and I said, silly, he is Norwegian. <laughs> and I swear we had about five or six people around us going, huh? I thought, well, yeah, there's where that education's kind of biting me in the butt again. Um, but, you know, it's funny, and, and I, when I married Charlie, uh, we have an interesting past, and I'll touch on it a bit, but when I married Charlie, I married into a fam- family of educators. That's not good. <laughs> no, because they, they believe that, you know, sometimes educators believe that you might be stupid, and that's what the inventory process did for me. Oh, I'm not stupid at all. I just never cared for school. I am very smart. Matter of fact, I was uh, uh, just retired after a 30-year career, and I was very successful in that 30-year fitness business. Of course, I chose fitness because it really didn't need a lot of math or geography or anything like that. But uh, but I absolutely loved it. But the inventory process showed me I wasn't stupid. See, I had to get that diploma. I left home at 15 years old and managed to graduate early by cheating. And for the longest time, I had so much shame if anybody knew I had cheated. And then I met, I marry into a family of educators. Oh, my God, they love museums. <laughs> I don't care. Charlie, we were just in Washington, D.C. He goes, you've got to like the Smithsonian. I'm like, <laughs> no, I've been to the Vatican. My girlfriend goes, can you just appreciate it? I go, no, bunch of dead popes everywhere. I'm not digging it at all, man. I'd rather be sitting at the bistro having coffee, checking out the shoes. I mean, call it shallow. It just doesn't do it for me. And I swear my husband just thinks he can teach me. He really believes he can teach me. He goes, I'll say, Charlie, how do you spell this? He'll go, let's sound it out. (laughs) Oh, no. No. Oh, I'll I'll kill him. I go, listen, mister. Don't you say that again. Take you down. Oh. Thank God for spell check. But uh, so, you know, my, really the truth of the matter is, oh, guys, I left home at 15. I am the kind of person who will get it done. I mean, I am. I was the kid when they said Red Rover, Red Rover. It was like, watch out. I'm coming over, man. I mean, I'm telling you what. I was rough, tough and ready. And the, the, the more afraid I would be, the more cocky I would get. I would put myself in situations that were so dangerous. And I love that Ron, he went through his whole childhood history because that's important for me to understand who I am today. I made me, you know, I didn't let God in this deal at all. And all of a sudden I have so much self-reliance that when I come into Alcoholics Anonymous, you tell me to lay down the only tool that works, forget it, forget it. You just take the drink off my back. And I got it from here. And that's exactly what I did. Because, see, I really saw the drink as the problem. I had no idea that the drink was the solution. I had no idea that the alcohol treated alcoholism. didn't cause it. It treated it. 
And so all of a sudden now, I'm not kidding you guys. I mean, you want any, you want me with a picture of the president next week? <laughs> I'll have it. I mean, I'm the gal. I used to tell people, you got a problem, come to me. I'll take care of it. I'm the, I'm the problem solver. Boy, we'd sit at the bar and everybody would be saying, what are you talking about? We're solving the problems of the world. We got all the answers. And the truth of the matter is, guys, is my drinking, my qualifications is when I start, I can't stop, and I can't stop starting. And that's what makes me an alcoholic. I had a little, uh, I got sober when my daughter was five. I drugged that little girl to places that she had no business being. I know incomprehensible demoralization. And so I just, I, I'm not a big fan of all those stories, you know. I'm just not a big fan, not a big fan putting them on CD. I don't want my daughter to ever hear some of those horrific stories. I hope so. she doesn't remember them all, you know what I mean? But I do have a tremendous of experience in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I come into AA, I chase a boy in, of course. See, a girl needs a boy to fix him, right? I mean, most of us, when we admit it, that's what we do. And I chased a boy into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and the first meeting I went to, I'll never forget, I saw three people in that room I knew. That's not good news. It's like, oh, oh, drank with you about seven years ago. And... um And what I didn't realize is I walked in the room of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I mean the laughter was was just fabulous. I hadn't laughed in so long. I was so angry and so miserable. I was a single mother blaming the world for everything. And, I mean, I just absolutely loved the laughter. I was one of the lucky ones. I, I fell in love with you people, and I did whatever you said. It was unbelievable, and the women in Alcoholics Anonymous surrounded me. And one of the things they did back then that I don't see so much today, not that there's fault, but I just want to put this out there for the new guy, is they took my phone number. They gave me their number, but they took my number because I wasn't calling anybody. You think you really want me to call somebody? Are you out of your mind? And they were all fun for about an hour But I'm not calling anybody. And they call me. They must have called me seven seven uh, different times in one day. What are you doing? Need to go to a meeting? What do you need to do? Come on, get in the car. Get in the car. Get in the car. That's all they said is get in the car. Get in the car. Get in the car. I loved it. Well, that boy I chased into AA, oh, he had six years. He was a Texas boy, but he'd been at the Pacific Group. <laughs> yeah. I'd heard about Clancy on day one, you know. But uh, it was interesting because he was a big book thumper, and he used to sit and read the book to me, and I'd sit at his feet. <laughs> you know, and he goes, he goes, Katie, this is all wrong. No, it's not. No, come to my vortex. No, no, no. Because that's what we women can go, no, come, come. <laughs> and uh, the next thing you know, We got married. Yeah, he, he was living with me in about seven days. Yeah, he moved in. And uh, he kept saying, it's wrong, it's wrong. No, shh. <laughs> But uh, we got married. We were married for 20 years. I got to tell you, I'm so glad that nobody was the arbiter of my sex life. The book says clearly, do not be the arbiter of anybody's sex life. I don't know if you guys are going to make it or not. Remember, I'm only the vessel. Just a vessel to get you connected to the power. I tell you, put your seatbelt on if you're going to get in a relationship in early spring. It's going to be one bumpy ass road. But, you know. And so uh, what ended up happening, he had six years sober. We were sober. We had the same, we shared the same sobriety date. He was just six years ahead of me. And so as things happened, what happens when you get sober? Man, you got the gifts of sobriety. I was working the program. I was thrown into it. It was all about doing it quickly, right? And so I'm working the program. I'm getting gifts like you wouldn't believe. My business is soaring. I'm doing codependency recovery therapy because everybody in AA was doing that at the time in the 80s. You're getting your chakra on. You know what I mean? You're talking about your inner child. Nurture your inner child. Nurture it. Talk about it. Beat on that pillow. Go ahead. <laughs> And it was working. That's all I can tell you, man. It was working. And so at about three years sober, Joe had nine. He said, honey, I think we need to go to church. And I thought, oh, I don't really know if I want to go to church. And he said, no, no, no. I found this really cool church. 
And uh, he said, and because, you know, I was raised Catholic and, you know, nothing wrong with Catholic. As a matter of fact, the book tells me, to, you know, not to not to judge the organized religion at all. I'm not saying that, but I got to tell you, in the Catholic religion, I didn't pick up much. I mean, the guy was up there. He had his big old crown on and had his back to him. He kind of looked like this. Once again, I'm all about boogers, man. I'm just trying to flick a booger on my sister, you know, try to get her to say something at mass. And, and he was speaking in uh, Irish, Latin, what, something, 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 one of those terms, and pig Latin, something like that. And, and, uh, and so I just didn't get my, I mean, I, I left church, you know, I was out of church with not much. And so uh, he says, no, let's go to this church. So we go to the church, and I will never forget. It was a it was a, a twist off. It was non denominational, but a twist of Pentecostal. And oh my God! Oh. I mean, there was big screens just like these. Oh, look at that! There was big screens just like. Oh, there she is over there too. <laughs> so there were big old screens like that, and there was about five lines, and you would just sing those five lines, you know, and you just going on and on and on. And I was like, Oh my God! I love this. I love it. Young people, young families, we'd had another baby. And all of a sudden I was thinking, oh, my God. And at some point, now don't get me wrong, at some point I found Jesus. (laughs) Me and Jesus. And, you know, it's funny. People always go, oh, my God, is she going to say that again? Just Jesus, 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 Jesus. (laughs) And, uh. You know, you can stand up here and talk about the Dalai Lama, Tupac, Oprah, anybody you want to talk about. You mention Jesus, everybody goes, oh. Jeez. But uh, what I didn't see is I became a Jesus freak. Okay, and I'm not kidding. Charlie knows. He was there. And so what I did is I realized that the book says, for if an alcoholic fails to enlarge his spiritual life, I thought there was a period there. Oh, no. So I thought, well, I'll go to church to do that. I'm falling in love with the church. So I really don't need AA that much, but I kept all my AA friends, right? I'm three years sober. I keep all my AA friends, and I tell them, you know, because they are, they're heathens. You know, I'm sorry. They are. They're heathens, and they need to find Jesus. And, um, you know, so, you know, Joe and I did a 12-step recovery program with, you know, Jesus Christ in it. And, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> And it, it got it got ugly and real ugly. And the only friend we didn't run off was Charlie. He'd go, I'm obviously not living in your Christian values. I said, no, you're not. You're quite the pig. Marrying all these young girls in AA, for God's sakes, procreating across the country. And uh, but uh, I, I'm not kidding you guys. Joe and I, we're chameleons. I've never heard anyone else use that term. I, we are chameleons. We looked Amish. We blended. I even started wearing underwear. Yes, I did. I'm telling you, it was, I thought everything was right and good. You could have put me to a lie detector test and I'd say this is the answer. I got AA took away my drinking. I got codependency recovery for my issues. And I got church for my spiritual growth. Boy, was I missing a lot. And don't get me wrong. Church is wonderful. Church is along with. It's not instead of. I did it instead of. So please don't come up to me and ask me if I still love Jesus. Okay. I, uh, and, and, uh, what people hear is shocking to me. Oh, my God. So are you still, you still a believer? I'm like, oh, come on. What if I said, no, I'm not. But, you know, so this is, this is, Mark used to say he'd see people pray and meditate their way right out of Alcoholics Anonymous. You could do it sitting on, you know, at the feet of the Dalai Lama. Doesn't matter where you go for your spiritual growth, but it's along with. We alcoholics have got to have these 12 steps. It talks about that in Roland Hazard. It says church won't do it. It will not bring about the significant spiritual awakening you need. So Joe and I are doing the church thing. We do it for three years. We keep our AA friends, right? We just don't go to meetings anymore. And now I'm six years sober. Joe's 12 years sober. And all of a sudden, I'll never forget this. I'm sitting at a red light. 
and that was when you could take a right on red. Oh, I swear, I think that's better than the iPhone, but that was big news. You know what I mean? A right on wet red was big stuff, and this, this elderly woman was not taking a right on red. And she was in front of me, and I thought, I am going to shove her right into the middle of that intersection, <laughs> for God's sakes. All in the name of Jesus, man. I'm going to do it and teach her a lesson. And I got home, and I, I told Joe, I said, oh, honey, I am not doing good. I mean, I actually played through my mind shoving a woman in the middle of an intersection. He goes, honey, I'm not doing well either. I go, what, what are we going to do? And he said, we need to go back to AA. And I said, we sure do. And, I mean, we beelined it down to the club. And we went in there, and there was our faces. And I leaned over to him, and I said, honey, we're home. We're back with my people. You guys are my people. You will always be my tribe. See, I fit in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what I didn't realize is the gifts had taken me away. All the wonderful things that come to you when you quit drinking. A lot of people leave because of the gifts. And uh, unfortunately, I'd love to say we skipped down the, you know, the yellow brick road. But we didn't. And what ended up happening from this point on is when it gets very, very rocky. At that point, we had quite a bit of sobriety. We were still doing codependency recovery. Oh, my God, you guys, I did 10 years of group therapy. Uh, and it was helpful. Don't get me wrong. But what happened, I could, I could throw down a pseudo group right here and coordinate the whole thing and tell all of you guys what your issues are, trust me. I mean, I, I could do it. But uh, what ended up happening was I, I, I learned a lot about how Katie operates. I learned a lot about Katie's old ideas. But what I did with all that information is I set boundaries and I detached. So if you were a problem, I just detached with love. And what I did is I set everybody wherever they needed to be. Because if you didn't do what I needed you to do, we're going to detach with love. <laughs> and it was, oh, it was sick, 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 sick. So I got, I entered into what I call meeting-based sobriety. To which our, uh, Joe and I went to, oh, we went to a meeting a day. Well, you have to go to a lot of meetings if that is your recovery program. Because what you get is relief, but you don't get the freedom. See, I needed to go to a meeting because I was around so tight that day. Because I'm not really working the steps. Now, if I personally offend you, I'll come back and apologize. I mean, I knew that much. And I'd worked a pretty amazing AA program, I thought. But what I didn't realize was I was going to AA meetings so that you would share just what I need to hear to give me that relief. But I never got in touch with the freedom. And I also was in AA meetings so that you would share out of the big book so I could learn the big book from you. That was the other very, very crazy, sick thing I was doing. So I basically became what I call stark raving sober. And, uh, oh, I see it all through the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was just uh, trying to help some parents uh, at an Al-Anon meeting. They asked me to come speak as the alcoholic to the parents about their children. And I said, uh, I, would, I would love for you guys to be able to kick your kid's butt to the curb. That's what I hope. And I said, it's the greatest thing that you could do for them because you're the chief enablers. And this one man came up to me and he said, you know, I am, a, I am my son's greatest enabler. And I said, well, you won't be able to get in touch with the power to do that because you al are uh, your disease makes you have to fix us. And that will never happen. And you have to get in touch with that power to be able to kick that kid out or to stop that enabling. And he goes, well, I'm also alcoholic. I said, really? And he said, yeah, I got 30 years sober. I said, ew, really? He goes, yeah, I don't, I don't do meetings anymore. As if meetings are treatment for alcoholism. We say that as if they're treatment for alcoholism. They are not treatment for alcoholism. They are a very important part of our triangle. The unity is crucial that I be in the middle of the herd. Because I'm safer there. But, oh, it is not treatment for alcoholism. It's just, we say that the only thing we know that's treatment for alcoholism is the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Having worked those steps, having to have a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, they're not linear, they're circular. You never stop working those. And so what ends up happening, and I said to this man, I said, really, you got 30 years sober. When was the last time you read your big book? And he goes, 20 years ago. 
And I looked at him, I said, good news. We got good news here for you. I can get you in touch with that power that can help you do this for your son. And I said, because, see, we, you would think alcoholics would understand it more than anything, that they're beyond human aid. If they are, in fact, one of us, they are beyond human aid, yes? So it's interesting. I'm, I'm a huge fan of the Al-Anon program. I'm a huge fan of helping them understand the disease of alcoholism. And so what ended up happening, I'm stark, rave, and sober. See, I believe that the 12 steps treat alcoholism. And if I'm not working the 12 steps, then I'm not treating my alcoholism. So I'm an untreated alcoholism sitting in the rooms. We call it a lot of things, complacent, dry. I like to call it untreated alcoholism because behind it we lose a lot of people. You're very fortunate to have come back after that much time. I'm really happy to see you here. I mean, how many of you guys know how many people we've lost at 5, 10, 15, 20 years? They either shoot their self or they never come back. And that's what I'm talking about. That's what I was sitting there with in meeting-based sobriety. Now, I didn't know that. I'm not holding anybody responsible for that. But I sure had to find a really sick AA meeting to go to. And let me tell you, there's some sick ones out there because I was an active member of a sick group. And so I'm going to this sick AA meeting where we're not even talking about alcoholism. Matter, we're, we're talking about all y'all. And if I ever did step into a meeting that had any solution, I had to pick you off. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's old John Henry, the big book thumper with his bow tie. <laughs> and that's what we do. We end up blowing up the only thing that's going to save our life. And that's what the ego does after it rebuilds. You see, I believe what was happening here, and I didn't know it, was the second surrender to the third step. Charlie and I did a third step workshop today. I did not, I misunderstood the third step. We believe that if there is anything being done incorrectly, God forbid you say that, it's when they, you take somebody, you, you, you make sure that they are in fact alcoholic. Could there possibly be a power that could restore you to sanity for the drink problem? Yes? Get on your knees and let's do the third step prayer. There's such a huge body of work that we both missed. And that's between the pages of 60 to 63. And it talks about being convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. I didn't understand what that meant. That's that self-reliance that I'm talking about. So I'm sitting there in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous running the show in constant collision in my workplace. And I always put it under the cloak of I'm doing the right thing here. That person isn't a good person to have in your life anyway. And I had done the tornado of all the amends, right? You know, the amends, I think I made 15. The list found its way into a drawer. I was amazed before I was halfway through. What can I say? Yeah. You know, and it's interesting because I love, I love what the book says. <clears throat> it says on page 25, if you're a serious alcoholic as we were, we believe there's no middle of the road solution. We were in a position where life had become impossible. And if we had passed into this region from which there is no return through human aid, we had but two alternatives. One was to go on to the bitter end, blotting out the consciousness of our intolerable situation. Would you think there's people sitting in the rooms of AA with intolerable situations? Absolutely. Uh, the best we could, and the other was to accept spiritual help. Remember, Charlie referred to this about Clancy. He, he says, you don't understand. My problem's different. Is the flag that we all fly. When, I'm, when I've got some time behind me and i got a serious problem, somebody in the family is sick, I've just lost my job, don't come at me with your AA solution. This is a big problem. See, and what I didn't realize is, is that the 12 steps could solve all my problems. Boy, was I moving away from that. I really did. I became the slogan slinger. You know, I mean, when, oh, I didn't know I'd hitched my wagon to the middle of the road. I mean, I just hitched it right there and just moved on, right? And so, where are you going? Okay. Keeping an eye on you, Missy. I love that dress. Mm-hmm. I met her in the back. I know a lot of y'all like it, too. Uh-huh. You're not fooling me there. Um, I met her in the bathroom, and I said, I love a black cocktail dress. She's like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so 
uh, you know, I became a slogan slinger. And what I did with God was I did the God deal like this, is that it was God's will, self-will, God's will, self-will. I'd hand God the baton and go, you take it from here, man. It's bad. And then all of a sudden, he just works so slow. And I go, you know what, give it back. Give it back right now. For God's sakes, I can get this done faster. I can get my kid to school, chew out his teacher, and move on, okay? You know, I, oh, my God, I can't even begin to tell you. Oh, oh, oh. There was one store that when I walked in, it was a big retail store. They go, Code Red, Code Red. She is in the store. Extreme example of self-will run riot, comma, what's it say? Though he usually doesn't think so. And uh, just delusion, delusion, delusion. I have a spiritual disease of delusion. It is a it is a soul sickness that I have. And so I become this slogan slinger. Somebody's hurt and I go, turn it over, man. Just let it go. I love this one. Acceptance is the key. I want to kill you. I really, when I was really having troubles, I wanted to punch you in the face if you said those things to me. I'm like going, for God's sakes, and what I didn't realize is the book says, if a mere code of morals or better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many of us would have recovered. So what you're saying to me is work the promises and hope the steps come true. <laughs> See, I, all I knew is I wanted to punch you. So, okay, so... I knew there was something jacked about this whole thing, but I didn't realize it till I got into the book. And I said, for God's sakes, we were lobbing out promises. And what I found that I needed to do is when somebody's hurting in an AA meeting and God knows if they're hurting, this is what they do. All right. Anybody, anybody got something they want to talk about? Mm hmm. I hate my boss. I hate my boss. So I walk over there to him and I said, man, it sounds like you're really struggling with your boss. Yes, I am. I'll tell you what. Let's go outside real quick. You got a few minutes. Yeah, I got about 30 minutes. Let's write a four column inventory. Let me offer that up to them. See, I am the vessel to get you connected to the power. I'm not the one to lean over to the person next to me. Go that idiot's not working the program. No, my job is to take them outside and show them where where the power is. And the power is that they got to have their problems of their own making. It's one of the greatest promises in the book. So my problems are basically of my own making. How am I going to find that out? i got to put pen to paper. I have got to put pen to paper, especially if I believe I have been justly wronged. Y'all with me on that one? Oh, yeah. Take them down. <laughs> so... Um, what ends up happening here is my, uh, my husband gets sick. We're both self-employed because we're hard-headed alcoholics and we don't want a boss. So we're both self-employed. Well, what happens when you're self-employed? You don't have a very good health plan, right? So we don't have a very good health plan. My husband gets sick, and I think he's got serious depression. I can't figure out what's wrong. And he's got a sad, sad, sad past. And so I think he's got serious depression. And the psychiatrist says, I think it's organic. I don't know about you guys, and I, I mean, I was a pot smoker. So, you know, you say organic, I think pot. You know, I mean, that's, you know, I, once again, the brain ain't very big up there, trust me. And I'm really okay with that. Uh, but I, I looked at the, I said, or, what do you mean organic? You know, I'm thinking pot, what, what? And he says, I think something's growing in his brain. I said, oh, God dang, that sounds bad. And I said, well, what do you want to do? He goes, well, we need to have, run a lot of tests at the hospital. Well, we had catastrophic insurance. See, you hurt, threaten, or interfere with anything of mine, and I don't care how long I'm sober. I'm going to run the show. Rarely, especially with no AA program, I'm going to run the show. So you better get out of the way because I know how to, I know how to fry up the bacon, you know. Never, never, never. How does that go? I usually get that one good. I can bring home the bacon, fry it up in the pan. Oh, yeah, move out of the way. I got this one. <laughs> and so um, I'm at my sick AA meeting, and my girlfriend says, Oh, Katie, you know what? You ought to uh, drive a school bus. You'll get instant HMO if you drive a school bus. Don't forget that. <laughs> and I went, Shut up. Well, I'm in the fitness business. I, I can make my hours anything I need. And I can fit a bus driving job in there. As a matter of fact, this is how self-centered I am. When you hurt, threaten, or interfere with anything of mine, I'm going to go get that bus job. 
And I'm only going to have it long enough to run those tests. So I'm not thinking about the system. I'm not thinking about my bus boss. I'm not even thinking about those kids. I need to get my husband's head scanned. So I'll go down there and I'll, I'll do my time. I was thinking about six weeks and then I'll quit. Now they'll be disappointed. <laughs> See, if you were in my situation, you'd understand you do the same thing, right? That's what we say. So I go down there. I get this bus job. Oh, my God. Was Well, first of all, I was the cutest bus driver there was. Wowza. Do they need some fashion overhaul there? But, uh, whoo, I'm out there whacking the wheels on that bus. I'm half tomboy anyway. You know, I, I don't know what I'm listening for. I'm just like whack, 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 whack. And I got a gas bus because it goes the fastest. It was the oldest bus, but, man, it hauled ass. That's a, just get from point A to point B and get done with this thing. So I tell my husband, I go, honey, we got an HMO. We're going down to the hospital. I called his doctor, and he said, just take him into the emergency room. And, and, and I, he may have said, now that I think about it, he may have said they're going to run into a gamut of tests, just fail. Just get that head scan. So I tell Joe, Joe, listen, here's the deal. When we go in to get your head scan, they tell you to touch your nose. I want you to touch your elbow. Okay, listen. This is how we're going to run this deal. They tell you to touch your knee, you touch your nose, okay? We're getting your head scanned. He's like, I'm on it, I'm on it. We stopped and had coffee on the way, you know what I mean? And then we get down there and we walk in, and I got a lot of old ideas about doctors. I'm sure it all happened with my mother dying, but I got a lot of old ideas behind doctors. And in walks this, you know, just cool guy. And he looks at me and he just does this. That's all it takes for me. I'm like, I can't stand you. <laughs> and he goes, so, you think he's got something in his brain? I'm like, yes, my name is Katie Gordon, M.D. <laughs> and I said, yes, I do believe he does. We need to have his head scanned. Let's just get it scanned, get it out of here, and get me off that bus. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, <clears throat> and he says, well, Joe, he goes, let's, uh, let's have you touch your nose. And Joe goes, <laughs> I'm like, what the hell? What are you, you're blowing it, man. And I just, I can't even believe it. I'm like going, oh, my God. And he, let's touch your knee. And I thought, oh, we got to go to plan B. I swear at this point I'm thinking about knocking the dock out, taking his white coat, shoving Joe in the tube. I don't care. Hitting all the buttons, you know. I'm getting his head scanned. And, uh, and, and you have no idea that that was an option. I'm stark raven sober. That's not out of the question. And so uh, the doctor starts adding Joe, asking Joe to add 2 plus 2, and he can't do it. And he looks at me, he goes, I'm going to go ahead and scan his brain. I'm like, well, I could have done that 20 minutes ago, but whatever. <laughs> and so Joe and I are sitting there talking, and the doc comes back in, and I'll never forget this moment. He puts his hand on my shoulder, and he goes, my God, he has a gigantic mass growing in his brain. And my very first thought was, I'm going to be driving this damn bus forever. <laughs> Welcome to the level of self-centeredness we alcoholics have. See, I didn't say that. But that's the level of self-centeredness we're talking about in these rooms. Mm. I looked at my husband. We both cried, and he didn't leave that hospital for 11 days. He had a huge mass in that brain. I ended up driving that school bus for three years. Oh, my God, I could make you wet your pants on some bus stories here. I'm... Oh, I'm going to tell you. Oh, yeah. That bus number 19, the turtle bus, hauled ass. It was a gas bus with no governor. And I mean to tell you. And I, I was so crazy because now my husband has massive brain damage. He, it, was, it ended up being benign. It was unbelievable. They knew it was lymphoma. He was going to die in 15 months, yada, yada, yada. It was benign. It was the best situation you could imagine. And I'm driving this school bus, and I am just thinking, oh, my God, what has happened to my life? I'm 15 years sober, losing my mind. And what I ended up doing on that bus, people would get in my way. And I, I drove for a pretty wealthy neighborhood, and it was the neighborhood that we lived in. And there was a guy I'll never forget in a BMW. And, you know, in the mornings, if any of you guys are on bus routes, you know, you hit the, you know when the bus comes, bus has to be there at the same time every time. And this BMW guy always tried to beat me. 
so I would see him coming, and I'd just shoot that door open, and that stop sign pop out. I wasn't even at the bus stop. I swear to God, this guy would go, what is wrong with you? Like, Bring it. Oh, I was crazy. Crazy. My little kids one day, they said, at my little, they, I had like five or six little kids on the back of the bus at the end of the route, and there was these two bumps you could go over. And if you got going fast enough, you could fly them about five feet. And they'd, Miss Kate, come on, Miss Kate, come on, Miss Kate. And I was like, okay, okay. And I was always a little afraid of losing my job. You know, I needed that, I needed that insurance. One of my paychecks one time was 32 cents because I was paying for the insurance, right? I mean, my husband was a sick man. We needed that insurance. And so all of a sudden, I tell those boys, I said, okay, it was all boys. I said, get in the back. You know, you can just throw boys out the window, you know. Hell, you don't have to stop the bus. Go jump, 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 jump. jump. And uh, they're all the way in the back. And, and so I look to my right and I look to my left and I get ready and I gas it, man. And we, we shoot over both those humps and you have to come to immediate stop because I have to take a right. And I'm looking, you know, because life is right here when you drive a bus. You know, I'm you. Where are your hands? Show me your hands. They're like. <laughs> and uh, so I shoot over these two humps, right? And all of a sudden I hit the brakes and the back end of the bus just drops. And I shot the valve stems off. Four valve stems. Shoot. Off. I mean, I'm like this. Whew. And the kids all go. They, they come out and see. They go, what was that? What was that? We all get off the bus. We look, and I mean, they just scatter. Pew! They are gone. And I'm standing there going, oh, my God, I'm in serious trouble. I got four flat tires. A guy, a guy heard my story, and he said I work for Beechcraft. He goes, you can't blow the valve stems off. I go, you damn sure can. You think I made that up? And so I swear I get on the radio. I'm like, uh, turtle base to bus. I mean, uh. Uh, turtle bus to base, turtle bus to base. They're like, this is base. I go, man, something really bizarre happened. <laughs> I blew all the four valve stems off the back end of the bus. And you could hear the guy go, what did you do? I go, nothing. I came to a complete stop to take a right, and they all just shot off. Because, see, you hurt, threaten, or interfere with anything of mine, I'm going to lie. I am not losing that bus job. And when he came out there, because I'm not going anywhere. When he came out there, he saw those two humps. He goes, so it just, they just blew off? Yeah. No, I'm not budging. I swear to God, put me on a polygraph. I'm not budging. Oh, my God. And the last bus story I'll tell you till I move on, because it, it really was hilarious. We, uh, You know, I, I broke all the rules. We're, we're rule breakers. That's what we do. And especially when I have a boss. You know, I love that. I mean, the boss says do this, and we kind of do it. You know, and uh, they, you can't deviate from your bus route. Well, it was time to vote for the president that year. And so I thought, you know what, I'm just going to run by and vote real quick. It's just right down the street. It's only, it's only a one left from heading straight. And so I, I go in there, and I'm going to run in real fast, and I'm in the line, you know, and I'm just going to vote real quick. And nobody's going to know I voted, right? And I'm going to run back out. I run back out. I had forgot to turn my reds off. There's about a mile and a half of cars stopped. Yeah. It was like, I came running. I'm like, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah, those bus stories. I'm telling you what, this is how you can tell you're in self-will when you say, I am in over my head. Oh, God, this was a bad idea. Bad idea. That's usually self-will run riot. And so little do I know, man, I'm absolutely stark, raven, sober, and I'm in the bedevilments, which I believe are untreated alcoholism. And the bedevilments are on page 52. It says we were having trouble with our personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional nature. We were prey to misery and depression. We couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to others. Let me tell you something. I went to a doctor, and I basically told him that was what was wrong with me. And the only thing he knew to do was to give me an antidepressant. See, I went to him and told him that that's what I got. He's not going to go, you know, Katie, 
You need a spiritual awakening is what you need. So, you know, I'm not knocking antidepressants, but let me tell you, untreated alcoholism, that's usually what you'll, you'll find will happen. I'm not saying you don't need them, but boy, are we an over-medicated society. And so when I go to the doctor, I'm inviting him into my world with those problems. I had three blow-in-the-bag anxiety attacks while my husband was uh, with his brain tumor. And one point, you don't ask somebody with brain damage to give you a bag. He gave me a uh, plastic bag. I was like, <laughs> you know, it's not like you can stop at that moment and go, excuse me, honey, I need a paper bag. You know, three blow in the bag anxiety attacks. That's how untreated alcoholism will show up. I was stark raving sober. Oh, it was horrible. And then the saddest part of this whole story is my husband dies. He didn't die of that brain tumor. It was benign. He ended up relapsing. 23 years sober, died of heroin overdose. Mm-hmm. So I take, I take untreated alcoholism very serious in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know what the rest of that line said? For if an alcoholic fails to enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, he cannot handle certain trials and low spots ahead. The work is the 12 steps. Helping others. My primary purpose is to carry the message to another drunk. It's unbelievable when I look back at that. We, we were in untreated alcoholism and didn't know it. We were knee-deep in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. How can that happen? So I end up finding a sponsor. Oh, my gosh, this girl, it was so, it, you talk about God working miracles. She's in untreated alcoholism. But I liked her. And I thought, my God, I need something. I had 18 months of the bedevilments. It was horrific. And I ended up asking her to sponsor me, and she had known the Joe situation. I'd been married 20 years to Joe. And I called her, and I I was talking to her about my woes. He'd been gone 18 months. And she said, Katie, I want you to read your big book. I want you to read page 60 to 63. Well, I had to find my big book. And I thought, surely that's the part of the book that says some of us have it harder than others. I knew that that had to be in there somewhere. And I managed to open to page 62, where it says selfishness and self-centeredness. That, we think, is the root of our trouble. And I swear I went, that bitch. (laughs) I don't like to cuss from the podium. I've thrown a few dams and hells out there, but you got to know the the magnitude of that reaction. And so I went ahead and picked up the phone because I'm that kind of girl. And I said, what the hell, Marty? Didn't you hear what I said? You're going to tell me that I'm selfish and self-centered? She said, Katie, unfortunately, there's a fine line between sorrow and self-pity. And you've fallen into self-pity. Wow. Talk about an awakening. See, I believe a moment of clarity, if not followed by action, is of no value. And at that moment, I started doing the work. We ran into Mark Houston. Any of you guys ever know Mark Houston? He was an absolutely spectacular man. He was one of my biggest heroes. And he turned us on to a level of AA that I was shocked. See, I didn't realize that that second surrender to the third step, I didn't get it. I didn't get 60 to 63. I didn't get it. I had it explained to me. My sponsor makes me live in that. I swear, I think my sponsees think I've only read uh, three pages of the big book. Because, you know, I'm going back to page 61. What usually happens, the show doesn't come off very well, right? Because that's usually what they're calling about. And what I didn't know is I was a victim of the delusion that I could rest satisfaction and happiness if I just managed while I was managing my butt off. And I was in constant collision with something or somebody. I was absolutely miserable. I, you see, you, 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 if you filter your actions, my actions, through my delusion and my good motives, I think it's utopia. How many of you guys have been pissed off at your home group for something that you did to help them? And everybody's mad at you. See, behind a good motive, I'm blinded. And I didn't realize that 60 to 63 is talking strongly about a self-seeker even when trying to be kind. We use new terminology today, people pleaser. That's an attention sucker. Show me all the people you've pleased. Please, help me out with this. (laughs) Yeah, oh yeah. We We use therapeutic terminology that's not in the book. You know, we're controlling. Duh. I am so self-centered that that's what happens to me. 
See, I love where it says in the book, it says the actor running the whole show. If only my arrangements would stay put. I'm a self-seeker even when trying to be kind of producer of confusion rather than harmony. Where did I step on the toes of my fellows? Where did I set the ball rolling? Fear set into motion trains of circumstances I felt I didn't deserve. But where did I make that decision to set that ball rolling? See, I step on the toes of my fellows. They retaliate. But invariably, I find that I have made a decision based on self, which later has placed me in a position to be harmed. See, it's all about me. I don't, it's not that I think too much of myself or too little of myself. That's all I think about. I've got a set of blinders on either side of me that is all about me. It's in my DNA. And my experience is it doesn't go away. I'm as self-centered as I was from the day I walked into AA. The only difference is I got a set of tools that place me in a position of neutrality, safe and protected, that make me match calamity with serenity, that make me have intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle me. But my first thought, when you hurt, threaten, or interfere with anything of mine, I'm going to have to kill you. <laughs> See, I'm homicidal. I'm not suicidal. Killing you will be fine. We don't need to take me out this time. It's just going to be you. And uh, I keep score, and I get revenge left on my own power. <sighs> Self-righteous self-pity. Self doesn't care as long as you're thinking about yourself. It doesn't matter if you're standing on the highest throne saying you were right or, oh, my God, nobody understands me. Now, personally, I like self-righteous a little better because I can get the house clean. I can clean a house behind a pissed off resentment, man. I can wash that man right out of my hair. You know what I'm saying? But self-pity, I can't even get out of bed. You know that feeling. We call it depression. I think it's self-pity for a lot of us. Now, you guys that are clinically depressed are all pissed off at me, but don't get me wrong. <laughs> so I love where the promise says, so our troubles are of our own making. Remember, if I want to be free, the problem has got to be me. It's got to be. Sandy Beach does a wonderful thing on that. Oh, I love Sandy. You know, I tell you, I'm going to tell a real quick story about Sandy because I didn't, I wasn't going to say anything about it, but I found out he's talking all over the country about it. Uh, we were, we were speaking in Midland together and Sandy wasn't feeling good and he's sitting next to me. He goes, Katie, I'm not doing good. And he was very white. And I said, Charlie, go get, uh, go get Sandy some water quick. Somebody was speaking. And Charlie gets up and he takes, Sandy takes three breaths and then he just collapses on me. I thought he died. I mean, it was, it was three breaths like it was his last breath. And all of a sudden I look at Charlie. I go, 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 go. And Charlie goes and all of a sudden you can see people getting nervous and all of a sudden, you know, we're all around Sandy and he's out. And we lay him down and the next thing you know, somebody's called the, uh, EMT, we are in Midland, Texas. Oh, no, no, he is not having surgery in a Midland hospital if it's on my watch. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, and you know my whole deal about doctors. And so we get the EMT comes in. He looks like he's 21 years old. He's got no gurney. And I'm like, oh, this will not do. Oh, no. Sandy is 80 years old, for God's sakes. And the EMT goes, I'm going to sit him up. He's, you know, he's come to by now. He goes, I'm going to sit him up. And, uh, I leaned over. I said, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. And he, he does that. Oh. <laughs> oh, see, you know, you just don't put your hand in my face. <laughs> I'm going to probably do something that's not very pretty right now. And I thought, no, you know, I got the speaker ribbon on. <laughs> I am being watched. <sighs> it's like having that Christian bumper sticker on your car, you know. And, uh. So I am being watched, so I step back, and he sits Sandy up, and Sandy has a convulsion. That was it. I leaned over and said, that's it. Get a gurney. Get him to the hospital. I'm done here. Now. I mean it. And the kid, you know, I'm, I'm a powerful girl when I'm pissed. I mean, I, I do look gigantic, and I'm just a little bitty thing, but I look big. He goes, yes, ma'am. And he goes out there to get that gurney, and they put Sandy on there, and I'm collecting everything because I'm going to the hospital. I'm ready to jump in the back of that ambulance and slap it on the side. Come on, stat, out of here. Come on. And the guy goes, ma'am, you cannot ride in the back with him. I'm like, okay, where do I ride? And he goes, no, you can only ride if you are a relative or family or related to him or a family member. And I swear, hurt, threatened, or interfered with. I looked at the guy and said, I am his girlfriend. <laughs> and I swear to God, that little 21-year-old looked at me and goes, really? 
I happen to dig 80-year-old men, so what of it? Well, when we get to the hospital, oh, my story's weak. It's very, very weak. They start saying, what's his birthday? Well, we've only been dating a little while. <laughs> I'm like, I get that little mask. It's like, Sandy, what's your birthday? Hurry, 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 hurry. You know, so long story short, uh, I mean, everything falls apart. But Sandy is telling people around the country, he goes, let me tell you something. Get Katie Parker when you need something done. That girl gets it done. Oh, my God. I had him out of that hospital, that doctor. I had his, I, I, I asked him, I said, Sandy, do you mind if I run the show? <laughs> and he looked at me and he goes, have at it. I'm like, give me your cardiologist phone number in Tampa. I mean, I'm having him page. You, I mean, I'm on the phone out there. I'm talking to the doc. It was fabulous. We had him, we had him speaking Saturday night. I'm over there. I'm, I've got a nurse, and she says, I said, can you look in the computer? And she goes, no, I'm not allowed to. It's like. <laughs> and, and she keeps going, I'm not supposed to do this. I know. And this is what you do. I know. And you just, you just rub them gently. <laughs> she gives me all the information I need. It's just popping up on the screen. And uh, I come in there. I go, Sandy, we're going to be released. You can go ahead and eat that soup now. Go ahead. You know, because they don't want you to eat anything. Long story short, I'm running out of time. But so Sandy ended up getting a pacemaker, and he is alive and well. Uh, yeah. I'll go ahead and take that as a thank you. Because that, that surgeon at one point, he goes, he goes, I'm telling you what, he might have surgery. I'm like, oh, over my dead body. He is not having surgery in Midland, Texas. Let me tell you. Uh -uh. You might be a little oil town, but you stupid in the doctor area. I know you are. I know no doctor goes, God, I want to become a doctor and live in Midland. So I love what it says. It says in, in the third step, it says the terms we make. He provides what we need if we stay close to him and perform his work well. There are not too hard of terms. So when my sponsee calls me and she's lost her job and she's scared to death, she's got three kids, I go, hold, hold up, hold up. I said, I'm going to tell you, you are staying close to him and you are performing his work well. You are making all your amends. You stay current on your 10th step. One of the most underutilized steps in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's the discipline step. You're supposed to contact somebody when you're resentful, dishonest, selfish, or afraid. You're supposed to ask God to remove it, make an amends quickly if you've harmed anyone, and turn your thoughts to someone else. You work an active 10th step. You do evening review, and I know that. I know you're doing your prayer and meditation. I said, I want you to put three applications a day in and go down to the drunk tank and work with the drunks. And she, it was unbelievable. She followed. She was like, okay, okay, I will, I will. She had the most unbelievable job in two weeks. Unbelievable. See, you stay close to him, perform his work well, you won't lose anything. I really believe that. That has been by experience. It absolutely has. Now, you may lose cable. I mean, you might have to cut back a little here and there, but you're not, you're not losing everything. And so it says, um, and I'm wrapping it up. I know I'm very well aware of the time, my taper. Uh, so it says, um, and, and so, so I'm going to just do a quick little thing of the way I understand the steps today. The fourth step is to get me unblocked because God lives deep down inside every man, woman, and child. See, when I was drinking, I used to hear that still, quiet voice say, Katie, don't do this. Don't leave that little girl there. God was always trying to talk to me, even when I was drunk. And all we're trying to do is get that voice louder. I have an amazing open communication with my power today. Unbelievable. When it says rocketed into the fourth dimension, I thought I had been. See, see, when I, when I had the drink problem removed, that was such an amazing miracle that here's the, here's the drinking days. I moved right here. And, and this was the war zone, but this was way better than the war zone. I had no idea that God had this massive mansion out there for me to live in because this was good enough. And so what I did was the bare minimal, what you got to do to stay sober up until you don't stay sober. Up until my husband dies of a heroin overdose. All of a sudden I realized, by God, I'm in serious trouble. And what usually happens to us that we don't see coming is when, we, when we're in untreated alcoholism, all of a sudden we can do something as simple as crack a tooth. And we need to go get a root canal. And the dentist says, you're going to need Vicodin. Yes, I am. <laughs> 
And see, when I'm in untreated alcoholism and I got that malady on me, that Vicodin triggers the allergy. I don't know that. See, when I'm in fit spiritual condition, I think God can make that as medicine. But when I'm in the malady, it triggers the allergy. Next thing you know, I'm I'm scheduling more dental work. <laughs> right? We lose a lot of people to pills. For it, so it says it's a manifestation of self. We're looking at it from an entirely different angle. Yeah? It says, you know, that's that's what the inventory process is about. Showing me my old ideas, showing me self righteous, self pity, self seeking, self delusion. All of those things. The tenth step is to check my pulse on self centeredness. It's like a diabetic checks their sugar levels. My God, if you've ever been with a diabetic, it's unbelievable what they have to do every day. That's what the tenth step is for us. Every day. It says, I'm going to get angry. I just don't have the uh, privilege of staying angry. Resentment is the number one offender. It kills more of us than anything else. And let me tell you something. Charlie and I, we write inventory on each other frequently. See, because it doesn't say resentment's the number one offender unless it's your husband and you're pissed off at him. Stay pissed off. You can be pissed off at him as long as you want. i got to write inventory on the people I love the most a lot. Then the, t- the 11th step is the evening review. It's to check my work, right? It's to check my work. What, how did my day look? Did I do everything I was supposed to do? And then it says take your corrective measures into your prayer and meditation. You want to pray for world peace? Great. But that's not what our prayers are supposed to be. Our prayers are supposed to be for that day. Divorce me from self-pity, self-seeking, dishonesty. It doesn't say fear. It says all these things, self-seeking motives. That's what I run on. And then it says, you know, of course, the 12th step. Nothing so much ensures immunity as intense work with alcoholics. Not doing, not sponsoring? Duh. And if you don't have the answer, get it. I'm telling you guys, I believe there's a tremendous amount of help for the new guy. But I really, really believe middle management is dying in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I cannot tell you since I came out of untreated alcoholism and I'm working it at this level, I have people in my receiving line in tears going, my God, I'm in untreated alcoholism. I've never heard this before. And you know what the great news is? The 12 steps are the answer. Isn't that the best news ever? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that gets an applause. The 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous will take you to places you can't even imagine. Thank you again for having me. Good night. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.